In Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, the Apostle Paul wrote to the brethren at Ephesus saying that Christ had given some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. As we go through that list, we see apostles and prophets. Obviously, those things applied in the New Testament times pertaining to miraculous works of the Holy Spirit. But then he describes evangelists, those who give themselves to teaching of the gospel holy, some pastors, those are elders, and then teachers. Today marks the first uh, Sunday of a new quarter. And so we have a whole new host of teachers teaching our classes. And I thought it appropriate today to acknowledge those who take the time, whether it's this quarter or any other quarter, to study, to work, to prepare, to be able to teach in our classes, but also to emphasize the importance and the need of teaching the gospel and the ability to teach the gospel, to teach salvation to those around us. To emphasize the importance of being teachers to start with, of having the ability, the mastery of the knowledge of scripture, of the plan of salvation, to be able to share that with others. And so as we consider our new quarter, I want us to be appreciative and think about those who have taught the gospel, maybe we think back to someone who taught us the gospel. Maybe we think back to a preacher, an elder, a deacon, maybe a class teacher, maybe our parents, our grandparents, anyone who has helped you to learn more about the gospel, being appreciative that they were willing to do that for you and for me. And so as we consider this, I want us to first start in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, obviously throughout the Old Testament, there was a consistent call on Israel to remind one another about all of the events that had happened over Israel's history. In fact, many of the Psalms go through and talk about the importance of remembering the events in Egypt and how that God brought up his people out of Egypt, how he led them through the Red Sea, how that he took care of them in the wilderness, how he brought them to the promised land of Canaan. Over and over it is reminded the children of Israel of what God had done so that they would not forget. And another component to that that was emphasized even within the law itself was to teach it to their children. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Moses says, says the word of God here in starting in verse 1, This is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Moses emphasizes to the children of Israel to listen to the judgments and the statutes, the commandments of God, listen to the law, and then to surround themselves with it. He says in verse 8 and 9, binding them as a sign on your hand, having, having it almost as frontless between your eyes. He describes writing them on the doorposts of their house and their gates so that they are constantly surrounded by God's word and they are constantly reminded of God's word. 
and the call on them to teach diligently their children in verse 7. To talk about God's word with them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. So that it's not just you who is constantly being reminded of God's word, but also your children. And that will serve as a benefit for you as well, because you're the one talking to them about it. Therefore, you're reminding yourself as you teach others. He goes on to say in chapter 11, starting in verse 1, this is an interesting statement from Moses. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. Verse 2, know today that I do not speak with your children. Notice what Moses says. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all his land. Forty years have passed as they wandered in the wilderness. These children weren't there. When God, through Moses, led them out of Egypt, when he delivered the plagues on Egypt, when he led them through the sea, when he did these wondrous signs. So Moses says, I do not speak to your children because they weren't here. I speak to you. And then he says in verse 7, your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. Your eyes have seen. You know and remember. Therefore, verse 19 of chapter 11. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. Notice the emphasis that he placed on, you know these things. You've seen these things. So I'm speaking to you. But then in verse 19, I want you to take what you know. Take what you've seen and then pass it on to your children. So that they, even though they didn't see it, they weren't there in Egypt, they will know and never forget what God has done. Now the unfortunate, the unfortunate situation is that over the course of Israel's history, it would seem at least on the majority, that there may not have been a very good job of teaching the children the way that they should have been taught from generation to generation. Because as we see Israel's cycle, its habit, it constantly would be faithful to God, then begin to fall away, turn over to idols, God would bring judgment on them, then they'd be reminded of Jehovah, and then they'd come back and serve Jehovah for a while, over and over and over. The whole book of Judges, that's what the book of Judges is about. Over and over and over. It's so important that each generation be taught and strengthened just as we may have been. It's so important that we don't just assume that our children are getting these things just kind of by osmosis or, or having a Bible close to them. Being reminded of it on the Lord's Day when we gather together and we have Bible class before our, our worship. When we have the opportunity on Wednesday nights to be able to be together to study God's Word. But two days a week, three hours a week is not enough to train our children in the way they should go. Three hours a week is not enough to establish a foundation that is solid in the hearts and minds and the souls of the younger generations. It has to be constant. And one of the ways in which I believe Israel started failing was that they started failing to remind themselves consistently. They believed that they knew God's word, they had it all, they didn't need to be reminded of it, and so they become lackadaisical in their study 
lackadaisical in surrounding themselves with God's word. And so gradually, if they weren't being constantly reminded of it, they would forget it. Now the beauty of God's design, the beauty of God's plan, for one thing, is that every Lord's Day, we remember our Savior, Jesus, and what he did for us. So that we will never forget But even the importance of the memorial of our Lord can lose its its value over time if we aren't reminding ourselves through the week of why it's so important. And this is why we need to make sure that we are teaching others, whether it's our children, first of all, certainly ourselves, as our bulletin article mentions this morning, that the very first student that we have is ourselves. The very first responsibility we have as a teacher is to ourselves, to make sure we know what God's Word says, so that we don't become, as Jesus called the the scribes and the Pharisees, the blind leading the blind, so that we don't become those who are attempting to say, hey, we know what we're talking about and we know the truth, but when we try to share it with others, we're not actually sharing accurately what God's Word says. We need to make sure it's ingrained in our younger generations to prepare them, especially for the rigors of society that you and I are facing all the time. Our children are not immune to these things. They're being exposed to situations and concepts far too young than they should be. But God's word equips us to handle it. In appreciating those who teach, both in our Bible classes and also those who teach at home, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever you may be, there is another important reason why we need to remember and appreciate those who teach because the future of the leadership of each congregation depends on it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and in verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy saying, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Notice Paul's words to Timothy in that it didn't just end at Timothy. And it doesn't just end with the individuals that Timothy teaches. Timothy is to instruct individuals to the point that those individuals can then teach others. And we're not just talking about preachers here. We're talking about people teaching the gospel. End of story. So much so that those things that have been committed to these faithful people, that they are instructed well enough, that they have been taught and have a firm foundation, that they can then teach others also. And then it grows onto itself. But what happens when you have Paul who taught Timothy and gave Timothy a good foundation, gave him the instruction in righteousness? Timothy then teaches sees faithful individuals, he gives them a strong foundation, but then those faithful individuals fail in their efforts to teach the next group that comes along, the next generation, so to speak. Maybe they don't teach them quite as well as they were taught, and then each generation that goes forward from there gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Each generation then is therefore more affected by the society around them. To the point that eventually you have individuals in the church that belongs to Christ who are so weak that they are like those that Jesus described with the parable of the sower. The ones in whom the the seed was sown in the stony ground And the plant sprung up for a period of time, but it had no root. It had no stable foundation. And any time anything difficult would come along, it just fell over. This is the importance of having teachers consistently teaching the full truth of the gospel. 
making sure that we are giving ourselves, those of us who teach our Bible classes, making sure we are prepared to do so, but also as parents, making sure we're prepared to remind our children not just of what we might call the basics, not just the uh, accounts of the Old Testament. It's never too early to start teaching our kids about baptism. (laughs) It's never too early to start teaching our kids about Jesus' being crucified, what he did for us. It's never too early to teach about the church. Yes, some of these accounts in the Old Testament, they're unique and easy to remember. But we also need to remind our children of what Jesus says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 1, one particular area that in some ways maybe the church at large may, may not do as good a job as we should in is as it pertains to preparing men to lead in roles of elders and deacons. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 1, Paul tells Timothy, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and then at the end of verse 2, able or apt to teach. If we have each generation who is not being taught as they should or being prepared as they should, then by the time they get to an age where maybe they are prepared to be deacons or elders, maybe they're not trained well enough in God's word to then be able to teach others. Maybe they've made decisions already in their life that would automatically exclude them from the qualifications and characteristics that deacons and elders must have. This is why we have to start young. We have to encourage our young fellows to make this a goal in their minds that to be help to have the congregation to have a stable foundation, to continue to be sound in the truth. We need to have sound leaders. And thus, these men, like elders of 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 2, and deacons in verse 8, must have a strong foundation knowing the truth. And that has to begin at a young age. The preparation for that needs to begin at a young age. In Titus chapter 1 and in verse 9, Paul explains to Titus, especially in the midst of the society where Titus is, why it was so important for elders to be able or apt to teach. Starting in verse 9, these men must be able to hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine or sound teaching, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. This is what an elder should be able to do. When Paul uses the phrase apt or able to teach, this is what he's describing. Someone who has knowledge of Scripture, not only to be able to apply it for himself in his own life, but then to be able to address those who specifically teach things that are wrong or do things that are wrong, to address and correct, to exhort and convict, verse 9. Verse 10, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Now when Paul says whose mouths must be stopped, you can't physically stop a person from doing what they want to do. They're going to do it. What Paul's describing is keeping that individual from having an influence on the brethren because an elder is supposed to be a shepherd of the flock. And part of the elder's job is to protect the flock from people teaching them something that is wrong, that would lead them away from Christ. So one of the things that this elder has to be able to do, these elders have to be able to do, is to stand for the truth in such a way that they can warn and edify the brethren to beware of the things that maybe someone 
something is being taught that is wrong. We have to encourage our fellows, and not just our young men, but we've got fellows who are in their 30s and 40s who in a couple of years, 10, 15, 20 years, may be ready to be an elder. But we have to be planning and starting to, to think towards that now. We have to build that foundation now. Because by the time we're 55, 50, whatever age it may be, and all of a sudden it comes to us, you know what, I, I wonder if I, I should be an elder. It's too late by then. Because if we're not grounded and firm in the truth, then we won't have men qualified to be elders. And what happens when congregations don't have men to be qualified to be elders? What does Paul say in Titus? Things are lacking. That's what he says. When you don't have that grounded, established leadership in a congregation, things are lacking. Third reason why it's so important to make sure that we are not only appreciating our teachers, but giving ourselves to teaching also, is to fulfill what Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. As we read earlier at the beginning, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. But all of that is for a purpose. And notice that that purpose is not to do the teaching and preaching on behalf of everybody else. That's not what Paul says. In verse 12, all of these individuals, they do the things they do. They teach, they preach, they help establish people in the truth. For what reason? For what purpose? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Not to do the work of the saints for them, but to equip the saints, each individual member, so that they are strong enough to do the work of the ministry. That term ministry or the concept of ministry is administering the gospel. So that it's not just elders and, and deacons and preachers and teachers who are administering the, the gospel. Each individual member is equipped. This is why it's so important to have consistent teachers who will teach the gospel. This is why it's so important for us to teach our children. This is why it's important for us to ground men, our young fellows, having a goal to be elders and deacons one day so that we will be equipped for the work of the ministry. That's why. He goes on to say in verse 13, until we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Now notice the importance of that foundation that Paul's talking about. Notice how he likens individuals who don't have a strong foundation. He likens them here in verse 14 to be like children. Children who are tossed to and fro with every wind of teaching. Someone who is not grounded. Someone who isn't stable and who knows the truth. They can be easily convinced of something that is wrong. They can be easily convinced by the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting and trickery of men. And that is the danger when we have individuals, entire generations, who are not as strong maybe as they should be. Who haven't either been equipped with a strong foundation or who are refusing to equip themselves with a strong foundation. Then they're, con they're constantly being convinced of every little thing. They think they know the truth, and all of a sudden they hear something new. Oh, well, now that's maybe the truth. Then they hear a new interpretation. Oh, well, maybe that's the truth, rather than being grounded in what the truth actually says. But then he says in verse 15, speaking the truth in love. And that's a key component as well. It's not just the content of what we teach, 
It is the attitude with which we teach it. And that is a key component as well. You can present God's word, and it may be the truth, but present it in a way that is hateful and ugly, a way that is condescending or suggesting that someone is, is not as good as you are, holier than thou. And that can be just as dangerous as teaching somebody something without even considering what their soul state is. That's why Paul says teaching the truth in love. Because we teach God's word, but we do it because we love souls. We love one another. We want each other to grow. We consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, as the Hebrew writer says. Verse 16, talking about Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. If an individual doesn't have a foundation, if they're not taught in God's word, how can they provide their share? How, what can they do? How can they benefit a congregation of God's people? This is why it's so important to make sure we have individuals who are teaching God's word and we'll apply that here in just a minute as to what that means. But making sure God's word is being taught, and it's being taught in truth and love. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 2, as we mentioned, we talked about how Paul told Timothy to take what he had been taught, commit it to other faithful men who then can take it and then can pass it along. And the application of that goes to furthering the teaching of the gospel. It goes to spreading the gospel. That's the point. That's the purpose. That's one of the reasons we're here, is to tell others the good news. In Titus chapter 2 and in verse 1, Paul encourages Titus to understand how to deal with different divisions of individuals. He divides people up by age and by gender. He talks about the older men and the older women talks about the younger men and the younger women and how Titus, how he is to deal with each group. Understanding the type of character that should be expected not only from Titus, but also from those individuals. One of the things he says about the older women is that older women, verse 3, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. The same thing is true for the older men as well. That's why he says likewise. But he says, verse 3, teachers of good things. And this is an interesting term. It's a unique term. It means a teacher of beautiful things. A teacher of, of that which is beautiful. Teaching others about God's word is a beautiful thing. Teaching others, especially as Paul applies it in verse 4 to the older women teaching younger women, of what our roles are. As God has given different roles to men and women, and as God expects certain behavior from the young and the old, all of us have a role that we serve. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 15, as Peter writes to the saints and he is addressing the persecution that they're facing, the great trials that they're dealing with of, of persecution because of their belief in Christ, the temptation might be to simply not talk about it. I don't want people to know I'm a Christian. I don't want people to know what I believe. Certainly in our society, that's, we don't face the same physical persecution that these brethren were, but that temptation certainly is here in our society now. And all we're facing right now is ridicule and maybe being ostracized, shunned. And yet these brethren are facing punishment, physical punishment. But in verse 15, Peter reminds these brethren, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Make him number one. Make him first. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The great application of this in its context is that despite the persecution, despite what could happen, if people know you're a Christian, 
Do not shy away from telling people the truth. Do not shy away from standing up for God's word. Don't be afraid to tell people to give a defense for the reason of the hope that is in you. The meekness and fear has nothing to do with being afraid of man. It's having that fear of God and therefore the reverence for his word that we ought. Meekness carries with it the understanding of being controlled keeping my emotions in check, keeping my reactions in check. Being meek doesn't mean being weak. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's having the ability to do something, but controlling it. Meekness and fear describes the attitude with which we're to talk to others about the gospel. In James chapter 3, and in verse 1, James, chapter 3, is a chapter we often talk about as dealing with the dangers of the tongue. And there is broad application available in James 3 about the dangers of the tongue. That's absolutely true. How difficult it is to bridle our tongue. But remember that the context of James 3 isn't just being aware of profanity or dirty jokes or things that we ought not to be saying. The context is being careful what we teach. In James 3 and verse 1, James says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. James is not saying, don't become a teacher. That's not what he's saying. He's warning all of us, when it comes to teaching others, how important it is that we teach others what is right and true. He then applies that in describing the dangers of the tongue and the damage we can do if we teach someone something that isn't right and the responsibility that we will bear at judgment for doing so. That's what James is talking about. He's not saying, don't become a teacher. Don't teach people the gospel. He's saying, appreciate and respect the responsibility appreciate and respect the fact that God is going to hold us accountable for what we tell others and teach others. In Hebrews chapter 5 and in verse 12, this is part of the reason we know James isn't saying don't become a teacher. Because in Hebrews chapter 5, the Hebrew writer actually gets on to the brethren, and he, the, 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 the brethren to whom he's writing, the Jewish brethren, because they are not yet teachers. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Here we have a perfect example of individuals either by choice, well, I believe it is by choice, either because they don't have individuals who are teaching them the full foundation of God's word, or they're refusing to heed it, or refusing to do their own study, perhaps all those They have not grown as they should. They do not have the foundation that is necessary to then teach others also. That's why he says, "For this, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be able to take the gospel and share it with others to the point that they have a strong foundation as well. Doing the very thing that Paul told Timothy to do. And yet, I have to go over first principles again, Hebrew writer says. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. He's unskilled. That's what he calls these brethren. And they had been Christians long enough. that They should have been skilled in the word, but they weren't. Either because they weren't working at it the way they should have been, it wasn't being taught the way it should have been, Verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, those who are mature. That is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice the component there, who by reason of use, they're putting it into practice. They're using God's word in their life. They're practicing God's word. They're teaching God's word because they're practicing God's word. That's the logical progression. They have not yet, to their shame, 
have not yet progressed enough to be skilled enough to first discern good and evil, much less teach others what's right and wrong. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, this is what I mean by making sure we understand what it means to be apt to teach, able to teach. To whom is Paul saying that? Is it just applicable to elders? Is it just applicable to preachers? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 24, notice what Paul says. A servant of the Lord. One who seeks to serve God must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able or apt to teach, and patient. It's the exact same phrase we see in 1 Timothy 3 regarding elders. Able to teach. But here we're not talking about elders. We're not talking about a specific context of preachers. We're talking about those who want to be servants of God. Here's the type of character and here's the type of foundation that you and I have to have. If we seek to serve God, we must not quarrel but be gentle. As much as depends on us, we have to be gentle with those. We have to be able to teach others. That is not specific to elders or preachers. It's for all of us. To be able to share with others the reason for the hope that is in us. Which means that if we are not currently at a point where we are able to teach others, we need to get there. If the Hebrew writer could write to you or to me and say, you know, I wish I could talk about the finer details of the gospel, but I can't because you're not able to handle it yet because you're still a babe, you're unskilled, and you, by this time you should be teachers, but you're not then we need to take a look at ourselves and seek to grow that foundation into the solid one that we need. In verse 25, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Notice the ability of the servant of God to teach those who are in opposition to God's word. Those who are saying things that are not true, saying things that are contrary to what God says, for us to be able to point out Scripture, to point out applications from God's Word and say, well, but God's Word says this, so why are you telling people this? Or why are you practicing this? The whole goal is so that we can save their souls. It's not about proving I'm right versus you're wrong. The old fella in San Antonio one of his favorite phrases, it's not about who's right, it's about what's right. Verse 26, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. In Proverbs chapter 4, and we're not going to read this whole thing. I encourage you to do so on your own, though. Solomon writes about the value of, of those who give instruction and how that the individual being instructed should remember those who taught him. Hear my children the instruction of a father and give attention to no understanding for I give you good teaching. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commands and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Remember Solomon also says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Therefore get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, wisdom, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. In verse 11, he says, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. We should be appreciative of those who, like David did for Solomon, 
instruct us in the ways and words of wisdom. In God's word, giving us a foundation. Our class teachers who instruct us in God's word. Our aunts, our uncles, our grandparents, whoever it may be, that help us to better understand God's word. Be appreciative of them but also take to heart the fact that we need to be as they are, as Timothy was, as Paul was. Not just in teaching a little bit of God's word, but teaching all of it. Providing a good foundation for others. The last passage for you this morning is in Ezra chapter 7. In verse 9, we find Ezra had come from Babylon to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. And in verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Notice the three things that Ezra had prepared his heart to do. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek God's word. That's the first thing. He had prepared his heart to do God's word. And he had prepared his heart to teach God's word. That is what the servant of God is supposed to do. That's what you and I are supposed to do. Are we prepared to do those things this morning? If you're not a Christian, you haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins, you're not able to do those things yet. To give yourself to God means to give yourself to his word. And part of his word says... He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. For those of us who are Christians, let's remind ourselves for the need to grow in our foundation in God's word and not just grow so I know the basics and then try to skate through life that way. Because the Hebrew writer says, you are not yet fully capable of discerning right and wrong if you're still a babe in the word of God. If you're still unskilled in God's word, you can't fully apply it. We have to grow and mature to be full age. We have to give ourselves to knowing his word, doing it, and then sharing it with others. If we can help you this morning, consider your soul state. Come as we stand and sing.